Douglas MacArthur was a great man filled with paradoxes. One of the greatest military leaders of all time, he was also an egotist whose clashes with two U.S. presidents bordered on insubordination. He achieved the country's highest honors for leading his men with selfless courage and heroism, but he also never missed an opportunity to promote his own image and ambitions. One of MacArthur's most tragic moments in his brilliant military career came in World War II, when he failed to defend the Philippines against Japanese invasion. Propelled by his unwavering belief in his own destiny, MacArthur struggled to redeem his honor and return to the Philippines in triumph. Douglas MacArthur had a great love for the Philippines and the Filipino people. It was a love that began with his father, General Arthur MacArthur Jr., a highly decorated Civil War veteran who helped repulse the Spanish from the Philippines in the Battle of Manila in 1898. The elder MacArthur was deeply impressed after seeing the ferocity with which the Filipinos defended their homeland against the Spanish. Douglas MacArthur was driven his entire life to equal the greatness of his father, and along the way inherited his father's high regard for the Philippines. Douglas MacArthur graduated first in his class at West Point in 1903, then launched upon a military career whose brilliance would eventually overshadow his father's. Commanding the 84th Infantry Brigade in France during World War I, MacArthur led his troops boldly and always on the front lines, becoming the most decorated officer of the war. He seemed destined for greatness. The eruption of World War II in 1941 found General MacArthur in the Philippines as Allied commander of U.S. and Filipino forces charged with defending a strategically important country against the advancing Japanese. After their surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan invaded several Asian countries, including the Philippines. MacArthur assured Washington and the Joint Chiefs that his Philippine defenses were strong enough to repel the Japanese, but he was overconfident. The inexperienced Filipino troops proved to be no match for the well-trained and well-supplied Japanese forces. In a surprise attack on Clark Field, MacArthur's newly arrived Air Force was practically destroyed. Japan's advance was so swift that to prevent loss of civilian lives, Philippine President Manuel Quezon declared the capital of Manila an open city, meaning it could be taken without opposition. MacArthur's forces were driven back to Bataan. Unable to hold their position, MacArthur, Manuel Quezon, and their respective families retreated to the island fortress of Corregidor to weather out the onslaught. For two weeks, the Japanese pounded the exhausted American and Filipino defenders at Corregidor. Washington and the Joint Chiefs became concerned for MacArthur's safety. The possibility of America's greatest fighting man being captured or killed by the Japanese would be a crushing blow to U.S. morale. MacArthur did not want to leave Corregidor. He wanted to stay and fight alongside his troops. It took nothing less than a direct order from his commander-in-chief, U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to force MacArthur to evacuate to Australia. This was MacArthur's most tragic moment ordered to leave his men behind, leaving the battlefield in disgrace and defeat. Arriving in Melbourne, Australia in March 1942, he spoke to his men from his heart of darkness. I shall return. The President of the United States ordered me to break through the Japanese lines and proceed from Corregidor to Australia for the purpose of organizing the American offensive against Japan, a primary object of which is the retaking of the Philippines. I came through, and I shall return. It was this promise that would drive and consume his entire life for the next two and a half years. He believed it was his destiny to return and liberate the Philippines. Bataan fell to the Japanese in April 1942. Corregidor toppled the following month. It was the largest surrender of troops in the history of the U.S. Army. Almost immediately, the Japanese forced some 75,000 American and Filipino troops to march nine days to a prisoner of war camp 60 miles to the north. This was the Bataan Death March. Already sick and starving from weeks of bombardment, Thousands of prisoners died or were killed by the Japanese along the way. In all, 
Some 10,000 U.S. and Filipino defenders died in the march and in the prisoner of war camps. MacArthur had been led to believe that a massive U.S. counterattack was building up in Australia. He was horrified to discover that virtually no planes or ships and few ill-prepared troops were ready for the counterattack, even as the Japanese soon threatened Australia by assaulting their colony of New Guinea. MacArthur could not afford another defeat as he had suffered in the Philippines. After months of brutal jungle fighting and massive Allied casualties, in January 1943, MacArthur defeated the Japanese at Buna, New Guinea. The tide had turned, and this was MacArthur's first step on his way back to the Philippines. Even as MacArthur skillfully managed his limited shipping and air power to rack up a string of stunning victories across New Guinea in 1943, President Roosevelt was leaning toward the U.S. Navy to take the lead in the war in the Pacific. MacArthur considered this a threat to his destiny to return to the Philippines. He needed to do something dramatic to convince Roosevelt and the Joint Chiefs to let the Army, not the Navy, lead the fight back to Bataan. In February 1944, MacArthur undertook a daring assault on the Japanese at the Admiralty Islands. With only a thousand troops, limited air and sea support, and using every tactic he had learned capturing Japanese airfields in New Guinea, MacArthur won the Admiralties in what even his harshest critics had to admit was a brilliant operation. It was enough to convince Roosevelt and the Joint Chiefs to give MacArthur the go-ahead to launch the assault he had been waiting for, for two and a half years. In October of 1944, MacArthur made good on his promise to return to the Philippines. Landing operations in the Philippines, striking first at Leyte Island, have now been undertaken by the largest ocean-going amphibious force in history. Here are General Jonathan Wainwright and some of his men who were captured in the Japanese invasion of the Philippines two and a half years ago. They are still prisoners. But now, fulfilling his pledge to the Filipino people, General Douglas MacArthur has returned, accompanied by overpowering military strength and by every able-bodied man who, under orders, left the Philippines with him. It took months of brutal fighting to push back the Japanese, but by March of 1945, MacArthur's forces had liberated Manila. The Philippines was declared secure in June of 1945. Since he left Corregidor three years earlier, MacArthur was obsessed with returning to the Philippines. He was driven in part by the humiliation of having presided over the largest defeat in U.S. Army history. He felt shame at having been ordered to evacuate and leave his men behind to endure captivity and torture at the hands of the Japanese. He felt that he had to redeem not only his own personal honor as a soldier, but also that of the United States in the eyes of the Filipino people whom he loved. Going down in history as the liberator of Luzon, this is perhaps what MacArthur felt he had been born to do. Perhaps in his own mind, he had finally achieved a level of greatness equal to his war hero father, to whom he had always looked up. With his triumphant return to the Philippines, Douglas MacArthur had fulfilled his destiny. <laughs>